Fannie gets appealed. Trump defense attorney Steve Sadow and other co-defendants are now taking this up in Georgia to the Georgia Court of Appeals. We're going to read through the full filing and see what is inside because the last appeal document that we got was just basically permission to appeal. Remember in Georgia, they got to get permission to take it up and the Court of Appeals still needs to accept it. But this is the application from the defense that's saying, hey, Judge Scott McAfee, your opinion was terrible. Fannie Willis perjured herself in your courtroom, lied to you, and she should have been gone for many, many reasons. Of course, he decided not to do that and decided to save her as long as her boyfriend left. Well, that was good enough for that courtroom. So this is what Steve Sado, Trump's defense attorney extraordinaire, who's done a great job on this. He posted this as he submitted this application for an interlocutory appeal. And as we talk about here, most appeals happen at the conclusion of a criminal case. This is not obviously a standard case as much as they want it to be. And so they're asking for permission to kind of pause the criminal case, settle this issue. This issue is so consequential that if it is dispositive, if they decide to get rid of Fannie, it might get rid of the whole case. So you can't really correct this at the conclusion of a trial and they want to get this settled right now. So here's what Mr. Sadow said on behalf of Trump and the other co-defendants in this filing. He submitted it saying, President Trump and eight other defendants filed their joint application for interlocutory appeal today. Now, defendants argued in the trial court to Scott that the indictment should have been dismissed and at a minimum, the DA Willis and her office should have been disqualified from prosecuting the case. Now, we know that Judge McAfee did not do that. Sadow says the Georgia Court of Appeals should grant the application and accept the interlocutory appeal for consideration on the merits. Submitted from Steve. This is the appeal. It is the application for interlocutory appeal. And the way Georgia works again, permission from the judge below, permission from the judge above, then the full court in the Court of Appeals will accept it. But this is a lot more substantive than the filing that we were asking for or we were reviewing and asking Scott McAfee for permission to go up to the next level court. Here's the case. Case is, of course, Donald Trump as defendants with many other co-defendants. It is the state of Georgia charging them with numerous crimes. But here, they are the appellants. They want to appeal this, the state of Georgia responding. And here is what the defense says, as big Fannie Willis isn't done yet. Sorry, Fannie. So pursuant to the rules and to the law, the defense says we are here applying for leave to appeal Scott McAfee's order that didn't disqualify Fannie. Saying, all right, here, Court of Appeals in Georgia, all of us as attorneys, we're going to say Steve Sadow's taking the lead on this, but we'll say, here, your honors at the Court of Appeals in Georgia, the defendants here were indicted by Fannie. Get some background on this. In August 2022, for their alleged act actions related to the 2020 presidential election. Now at issue here is whether DA Willis and her entire office should have been disqualified from prosecuting this case based upon DA Willis's inflammatory out of court statements regarding defendants and their counsel and other misconduct in response to this motion. Now, while the trial court factually found that DA Willis and her out of court statements were improper and that the defendants proved an apparent conflict of interest, for some reason, Scott McAfee, the judge, said as a matter of law that Willis could stay. And by doing so, he erred by not requiring Fannie to also go. And this legal error requires the court's immediate review. So here we got this. Now, an erroneous interlocutory appeal. So this is Sadow continuing, saying an erroneous interlocutory trial order that will cause substantial error at trial, right? So this whole thing, like, think about it this way. If Fannie is not precluded, if she's not removed. We have a corrupt, perjuring, lying prosecutor who's going to be on this case for the rest of the case. So her misconduct will continue to taint the rest of the trial. So we have to address this now. Like we're not going to have a fair trial until this issue is settled, which is why we have to pause this criminal case and settle it now. So here they say the March 15th order from the trial court that's declining to disqualify DA Willis invokes both criteria. Now, first, the erroneous failure to disqualify a prosecutor is a structural error that McAfee committed that would not just cause substantial error at trial, but it would render each and every trial in this case a nullity, right? How can you possibly have a fair case against a cheater? Now, given the complexity of this case, the fact that it likely will be conducted through multiple different trials, given the number of different defendants and the projected length at each of these trials is estimated by the state to be at least four months each, but likely even much longer than that. The time and the resources that the courts and the parties and the taxpayer Fulton County 
account, you're going to be forced to expend through this process of massive. If you don't settle this, we're going to have to go through trial in every one of these things. All right. And then we might discover once you do settle this. Oh, yeah. Fanny's corrupt as heck. So what does that mean? We have to invalidate all the remainder of these 15 trials and do them over again. They're making the point here like we got to settle this, right? Let's not put good money after bet. Let's figure this out now before we have to rebuild all this again. Saying it's neither prudent nor efficient to require the courts, the parties, or the taxpayers to run the significant and the avoidable risk of having to go through this painful and divisive and this expensive process more than once when an existing structural error can be remedied by this court right now. That being said, it doesn't deviate from the point that we're making here. If we have perjuring Fanny, we got a big problem for all of the trials. All right. Now, second, the need to establish precedent in this case regarding the disqualification standard for forensic misconduct is manifest, right? Judge McAfee, we had a lot of time here battling about what's the standard. We talked about all this case law. Is this misconduct? Does it rise to the level? What's the standard? Is it a clear and convincing evidence standard? Is it preponderance of the evidence standard? And so on. We don't know. So, hey, Court of Appeals, you can help us with that. The trial court candidly acknowledged the lack of appellate guidance on this important disqualification issue that significantly impacted his ruling. And in the forensic misconduct context, he noted there was no appellate guidance outside of Williams. Judge, I don't know what to do with this case. I don't know how to apply this misconduct standard. That his decision was unmoored from precedent. In other words, Fanny didn't have any notice about this. He felt confined to the boundaries of Williams. And so Court of Appeals, you can help clarify this so that other judges don't run into the same problem. Now, with additional and appropriate guidance from this court, Judge McAfee's ruling would come out differently if you gave us the right standard. And third, the trial court also expressly found that Big Fanny's challenged actions that were including hiring her paramour, her boyfriend called Nathan, found that as the lead prosecutor in his matter found that Willis was accepting gifts, was accepting trips that were funded through compensation and created by doing so an appearance of impropriety in this case that cast a pall over these entire proceedings. Now, the trial court was bound by existing case law to not only require Wade's disqualification, which did occur, so the judge got that right. Okay, there's an appearance of impropriety here, at least so one of you has to go. But also, right, if he's going to find that Nathan's bad, Willis has to go. And as a result, the entire office. Now, the trial court's failure to do so is plain legal error, McAfee, that requires reversal. And before we get into the nuts and bolts of how this works, they say, here's another reason why you should accept this appeal. Finally, the public's faith in the integrity of the judicial system, especially the criminal justice system, is critical to its functioning. And I know we talk about this and it feels like a platitude here. It's like, you know, I say here like a broken record. Legitimacy, credibility, right? Why what they're doing is such a problem is because it's wrecking that, right? Nobody has any belief that the FBI, for example, is telling the truth about anything. Courts have an obligation to ensure that the legal proceedings appear fair to all who observe them or not or whatever. When the public perception of the integrity of the criminal justice system is at stake, no prejudice to the defendants needs to be shown. The fact that we all know this is corrupt is enough. Now, nowhere are these interests more important or on display than in a high profile case like this one that has captured the attention of the nation. Crucial to the public's confidence is that prosecutors like Fanny remain and appear to be disinterested, you know, and impartial. Supreme Court case called Berger says the prosecutor is, quote, a sovereignty whose obligation is to govern impartially, is as compelling as its obligation to govern at all, and whose interest, therefore, in a criminal prosecution is not that it shall win a case, but instead that justice shall be done. Now, the prosecutor has more control over life, liberty, and reputation than any other person in America. And so that's why when Fanny goes ranting at her church about racist white people, MAGA Trumpers or whatever her, you know, keynote there was about, that's a problem because not only do they have the power of the prosecutorial badge, but they also have the power of the public sphere, the arena, the bully pulpit of the office, which is a very powerful position. We see it's even maybe more powerful than the superior court there in Georgia, in Fulton. So prosecutors are supposed to swear to, a, you know, take a higher oath, a higher obligation. And what we've been seeing out of Alvin Bragg, out of Fannie Willis, out of Letitia James, and out of Jack Smith is the opposite of that. To avoid a structural error, meaning the prosecutor is corrupt, so like the chair falls over, it would invalidate and it would require a repeat of all of the upcoming trials. And it would establish, if you accept this appeal, needed precedent in an area of disqualifying forensic misconduct, so we have better standards moving forward. And it would also protect and maintain the public's confidence in the integrity of 
our justice system because it would at least show us that a second set of eyes, at least the Court of Appeals, has taken a look at McAfee's terrible decision. So here's some background for us. This is Eric Court of Appeals. In case you miss America's most recent saga, they give us some background. They say, all right, on January 8th, defendant Michael Roman via Ashley Merchant filed a motion trying to disqualify Big Fanny and her office based on the personal financial stake that she had in an improper and a secret relationship with her lead prosecutor and lover and boyfriend, Nathan Wade. Now, the Roman motion alleged that Fanny hired Nathan and paid him about 650K whew, in a two year period. And that was personally financially benefiting from the relationship among other things. Now, the evidence revealed that within the seven month period from October, 2022 until April, 2023, Wade incurred over 17 G's. We'll use Fanny's language here. You know, if I owe a G, it's a thousand, right? So 17 G's in credit cards for vacations that he and Big Fanny took to Miami, to Aruba, to the Bahamas, and to California in Napa Valley, where they went around on wine tours. Now, Fanny was also admittedly the recipient of day trips to Tennessee, to Alabama, to South Carolina, North Carolina, other ports of Georgia, numerous lunches and dinners. And these expenses were not only shared proportionally or even tracked, they didn't keep track of that, they paid with cash. Now, indeed, Willis could only provide a single receipt for two plane tickets that totaled $1,300 $1,300 to offset the more than 17 grand that were paid in benefits by Wade. And long before the Roman motion was filed by Ashley Merchant, Fanny had already engaged in a conduct that was designed to prejudice the defense. Fanny began by repeatedly making widely publicized and improper extrajudicial statements throughout the course of the investigation, which clearly is in violation of her heightened ethical obligations as a prosecutor. Not supposed to do that. She's out there running her mouth in church, going to the media. The Fanny train is coming. So in spite of, or perhaps because of, the defense says, of the impending hearing on the motion to dismiss and to disqualify because they knew this train was coming, Fanny undertook significant efforts designed to prejudice the defense and to deflect attention away from her and otherwise to conceal the full nature of her disqualifying behavior. On January 14th, Big Fanny, only six days after the Roman motion was filed, blowing the lid off this whole thing, we were going, what? Fanny, reading from prepared notes, gave a speech at the Big Bethel Church, which is a historical black church in Atlanta, which was televised all across the world. And in that speech, Fanny, while concealing her personal relationship with Wade, she improperly injected race and racial bias into this case. She was up there at the podium. Why, God? Why? And that got spread all over the place, indicating that the defense defendants and their counsel were racist for challenging her unethical conduct, racism clearly, and that they were guilty and that they were gonna be convicted by her superstar team. And my superstar team has a conviction rate of 95% and all we do is win, baby, win, 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 no matter what, pass me the gray goose, implying that God himself had chosen her for this case. God is looking down upon her. And if you oppose her, clearly you oppose God. See you in hell, defendants. Now that he was on her side and that she was doing his work, in the prosecution. It's like sick, right? And she has prosecutorial power. And apparently the people in Fulton County are going to look pre elect her. I guess they love her. So approximately two weeks later, then this other company called the Hatchet Book Group, they published a book about Fanny and the ongoing criminal case. They put her out there as this, quote, hard charging, afraid of nothing prosecutor. And she did. She's pretty hard charging. She busted into that courtroom like the Kool-Aid guy. According to the authors, Willis gave them, quote, significant access and time. And Willis certainly knew that this book would be published prior to the trial in this case. In her extensive interviews with the book's authors, D.A. Willis continued to thrust her themes. I'm sure she did. That should be the standard moving forward. How many puns can we insert into our court filings? Yeah, Fanny was thrusting all right. She was thrusting her themes of alleged racism against her into her book, thrusting repeatedly, and her office into the public forefront, providing details of racist comments and threats of violence against her. I know, she's always under attack, as well as highlighting her need for enhanced security. Among other things, Willis told the authors that since her office had opened this case, the comments were always racist. Everything's racist all the time, nonstop, every day. She again invoked God as her ally, stating that she had God's protection and his direction in handling this case. So that's Fanny. Now, having already significantly compromised the defense and their due process rights, Fanny then began her efforts to conceal the full nature of her behavior from the trial court. This is the cover-up now, right? And the cover-up is way worse than the underlying crime. Like, the underlying crime was already problematic. Okay, but, you know, maybe it's not material. Maybe there's nothing 
whatever to it. So on January 17th, 2024, not long ago, Fanny, through her private lawyer, filed for a protective order in Nathan Wade's divorce. In that filing, Willis accused Wade's spouse, Jocelyn, innocent, nice woman, of conspiring with interested parties. Fanny says Wade's ex-wife is conspiring to interfere in this case and to use the civil discovery process to embarrass Big Fanny. That sounds like an insurrection, right? That is an implied threat of prosecution by the DA. And Judge McAfee's like just totally cool with all this going on. He's like, well, you know, somebody else can deal with that. I guess the state bar will look at it. I mean, so on February 2nd, Fanny filed an opposition to various motions to dismiss and disqualify. So it included an affidavit from Wade falsely claiming that they did not begin their personal relationship until 2022, which was after the appointment, which is why that date matters, and before the indictment. So Nathan Wade got appointed, remember, on 11-1, November 1st, and then he divorced Jocelyn on the 2nd. Nice guy. Hey, got my contract with Big Fanny. Yeah. So then tells his wife, I'm out of here so long, sister. I'm out. And the state's opposition came in after that. Now, at the evidentiary hearing, which we spent some time on, February 15th, both Fanny and Wade similarly testified under oath that their romantic relationship began around April, early 2022. But the evidence at the hearing, however, demonstrated otherwise. For example, the defense presented testimony of Miss Robin Yurdy, who seemed very credible to us, and said this woman was a former friend and an employee of D.A. Willis, who testified that Willis's romantic relationship with Wade started in 2019 and that there was no doubt that it began before Wade was hired. Sorry, Fanny, we have an actual witness who says they lied. Clearly started in 2019 at the CLE at the Judicial Conference when they had their robes on. They had their gavels around. They were like, I hereby sentence you to whatever. And they're like, you know. And that there was no doubt it began earlier. Now, Miss Yurdy's testimony was corroborated that was sent to Roman's defense attorney called Ashley by Terrence Bradley. Terrence Bradley was Wade's friend, longtime personal friend, who told Ashley, yeah, it started a long time ago. And he was also Wade's former law partner. He confirmed that the romantic relationship between Willis and Wade had absolutely started when Willis was a judge in South Fulton. They had their gavels, which was in 2019, of course. Now, the evidence was further corroborated by the analysis of Wade's cell phone records, where he's making Fanny calls late night riding over there, which proved that his phone was in the immediate area of her apartment on at least 35 occasions, including at least two overnight visits. The 11 months of available phone records that came before they said that they were indicting each other proved that during that period, Willis and Wade, they claimed that they were friends. Wrong. That there were over 2,000 phone calls when they were just friends, and there were just under 10,000 text messages. 9,700 text messages between the two of them for an average of 6.2 calls and 29.3 text messages per day. Oh my gosh. They did the math on that. These exact numbers were included in a non-public filing as an attachment. So we didn't see that before. Furthermore, Fannie Willis and Nathan Wade, this is the appeal from Trump's defense saying Fannie is really somebody who needs to be off this case. They both came into court and they testified to a wholly unsupported explanation of cash repayments. No idea where that came from. Without any documentation of payments or the source of the funds, despite the fact that they're both, you know, lawyers, apparently, and the fact that Fannie, you know, as an elected constitutional officer, has strict reporting requirements that require her to keep track of any expenditures on her behalf that exceed $100 in any given year. But she said that they weren't a gift, right? In fact, in her disclosures for 2021 and 22, Fannie certified that she had received no gifts or benefits in the yearly aggregate of $100, even though the undisputed evidence shows that she received the benefits of thousands of dollars of Wade, who was even listed in there as a prohibited source. So she knew, right, clearly lying, covering this up, like they're not idiots. I mean, they are, but you know what I mean? Now the trial court, Scott McAfee, criticized Fannie and her conduct during the testifying and her testimony at the hearing. He called her testimony unprofessional. He said that her overall conduct was, quote, a tremendous lapse in judgment. He said that there is an odor of mendacity that lingers. It's going to continue to linger. I mean, unless all of the odor was with Nathan and he's not there anymore. So if it's still lingering around, it must be coming from Fannie. So why is she still in the case? The trial court labeled the cash repayments as unusual and the lack of supporting documentation as, quote, understandably concerning. The trial court then went further, characterizing it as a, quote, financial cloud of impropriety, stopping just short of calling her testimony about these so-called 
cash payments, an outright fabrication, didn't say that. The trial court half-heartedly said that her testimony on this issue was, quote, not so incredible as to be inherently unbelievable. It was not so incredible as to be inherently unbelievable, which is like, okay, judge, if you believe that Fannie paid him back 50-50 on all of those transactions, I don't know what else to say. But the trial court gave DA Willis no such benefit of the doubt regarding the untruthfulness of her testimony about when the relationship started because he described it as potential untruthfulness about that. Now, the trial court also noted that, quote, there are reasonable questions about whether Fannie and Nathan testified untruthfully about the timing of their relationship, and that potential untruthfulness further underpins the finding of an appearance of impropriety and the need, if it is actually improper, to make proportional efforts to cure that. Saying, now, despite the damning findings that there was a significant appearance of impropriety, and instead of disqualifying Fannie, the trial court then punted. They punted Fannie's numerous legal and ethical violations to other people. Other people can handle this. To other forums and sources of authority, you know, like the General Assembly, like the Georgia State Ethics Commission, like the Georgia Bar, like the Fulton County Board of Commissioners, which I think they said we don't even have jurisdiction. And to the voters of Fulton County, I'm not going to interfere with democracy. And that they could offer feedback on any unanswered questions that linger from that stinky owner of Fannie's taint. So inexplicably, the trial court then permitted Fannie, the very person whose actions created the appearance of impropriety, whose explanation was not quite inherently unbelievable, whose testimony still harbors the question of being untruthful, who falsely claimed that she was not talking about the defendants in this case, who also created the lingering odor of mendacity, the woman who has been responsible for all all of that, the judge somehow is going to decide to cure the Fanny and the significant appearance of impropriety that in affects the current structure of the team, and he's going to attempt to purge this case to air out the noxious odor and the appearance of impropriety and the lingering stench of lying and falsehoods in Fannie and Wade's testimony. He's just going to try to air it out, destinkify it, Febreze all over the place. Not going to work. Now, and unsurprisingly, the choice made by Fannie was for Nathan to resign. She's like, later, dude. And again, he's out of there. He's like, this has been really great working with you, but I'm going to take my 700 grand and I'll, good luck. Hopefully there's no recriminations and there's no restitution and he's just off scot-free. So thus the case carries forward with Fanny still in charge, regardless of the continuing appearance of impropriety that the judge already described. She is there, her office remain involved, the case and the taint remains. So we appealed this, they say. On March 15th, the trial court enter an order and that order contains a number of legal errors and so the Court of Appeals in Georgia should accept this and rule accordingly. They say here are some problems. First of all, Scott McAfee granted the defense motion in part and made four determinations. So they're saying this is what McAfee did in his order. They say first Fannie does not have, this was a finding, an actual conflict of interest in this case through her personal relationship and her travels. That was number one, first finding. Now number two. Second however there is a significant appearance of impropriety that infects the case and the current structure of the prosecution team. And the appearance needs to be removed. What happens? One, Fannie can go and her whole office can go. She didn't do that. Alternatively, Wade can go, and we know that's what happened. Now, number three, the order denied Trump's and the defense motion to disqualify Fannie, saying that it was unmoored from precedent to do so, saying we don't have a background of throwing somebody off for this type of conduct, and so Fannie has to stay. And fourth, and finally, the order determined that Willis's appointment of Wade did not violate Georgia law, and so it could continue on. And so the court timely issued a certificate of immediate review, authorized this to go up to the Court of Appeals, and that's where we are now. Now, they say, what is the standard for appealing this? Here, as a matter of law, the Court of Appeals needs to correct the record below, saying, as a matter of law, Fannie Willis's, the Big Fannie's disqualification was required as a matter of law, and McAfee erred by not ordering it. And so, you should be reviewing this and vacate the lower court judgment. Here's the argument. They say, the Georgia Court of Appeals say, you can accept this appeal for an interlocutor 
interlocutory review if any of these things are true. One, the issue to be decided appears to be dispositive of the case, right? So if Fannie is disqualified, does this case go away? The answer is maybe on that. Like actually, yes, it could go away. Or like it's gonna settle the case. If we can settle it, let's settle it. The order appears to be erroneous and will probably cause a substantial error at the trial, which would mean a trial would be prosecuted by a corrupt prosecutor like Fannie, and it would adversely impact the rights of the people who are there, or the establishment of precedent is desirable, right? And so I think like all of these are good factors. If any of these exist, the Court of Appeals should accept this case. The order appears to be erroneous. They got some clear understanding of that. And if Trump goes to trial with a corrupt prosecutor, there will be a problem there. And we don't know what the standard was, so we do need precedent set. So basically three for three, I think those are all very favorable for the appeal, why the Court of Appeals should accept this. They say here the application easily satisfies the second and the third criteria. The first one is the 50-50 one, right? Whether it's dispositive or not. And while disqualification is not dispositive of the underlying allegations, failure to disqualify would require a reversal of any judgment that she got. It would have to come back down again. We'd have to do this over again. Now the application here, we get into some of the meat and potatoes of the application for the appeal. They say we should grant this because the erroneous failure, failing to disqualify Fannie creates a structural error. It's like trying to play with the cheater who you know is a cheater who's continuing to cheat in the game. It's like playing chess against somebody and they're getting, you know, the scoreboard and directions from somebody else. You're not going to continue to play against that person because you know that the outcome of the game is going to be rigged and tainted. They say the failure to disqualify a prosecutor is a structural error and structural errors require review. Courts have a duty to ensure that the accused are afforded due process of law and that means a fair trial. Trial courts must take strong measures to ensure that the balance of the factors is never weighed against the accused and the Supreme Court has determined that due process can be violated when there is negative pretrial publicity, when it's widespread throughout the media, television, and so on. And so the failure to disqualify Fannie in this case is a structural error, and we have a right to due process. They have a quote from Fannie in here. This is amazing. Well done. Here is a quote from Fannie they start section B with. It's called, the application should be granted to provide this court with an opportunity to set a standard, right? What is forensic misconduct, and when do we disqualify the prosecutor accordingly under that standard? Here's the quote from Fannie that starts this section off. She said this November 14, 2023. Apparently it's on YouTube at that length. Fannie said, quote, if I were to comment on any open case, it would be a reason to conflict my office out. That's true, Fannie. Yeah, you got it right there in November. So the trial court, for some reason, explicitly found Scott McAfee in its March 15th order that Fannie Willis and her extrajudicial statements made on January 14th were legally improper. In its order, McAfee deferred Willis's legal and ethical violations to other forums like a total weenie. He said, well, the Ethics Commission can look into this. The State Bar can look into this. How about the Fulton County? Whatever. Because he's so weak, he didn't want to do it himself. Even though they lied to his face in his courtroom. Wild. Really? But this cannot be squared with Scott McAfee's finding that the courts have an independent interest in ensuring that criminal trials are conducted with ethical standards of the profession and legal proceedings appear fair to all who observe them. So the trial court also expressly found that there are reasonable questions, Scott McAfee, reasonable questions about whether the DA and her hand-selected lead Wade, whether they even testified truthfully. McAfee said, yeah, there's an odor of mendacity that lingers in this case. And despite the findings, the trial court applied Williams versus State, our Supreme Court's decision on this type of stuff. It felt confined to stop short of disqualification due to a professed lack of guidance in Georgia law. He said, well, I didn't know what to do about this. I don't know what the standards are when to disqualify a prosecutor for forensic misconduct. McAfee wrote, the court is not located nor been provided with a single additional case exploring the relevant standard for this misconduct. How do we measure it? Or an opinion that actually resulted in the disqualification under Georgia law. Left unexplored, therefore, is how other examples of forensic misconduct can manifest, such as whether statements that stop short of commenting on the guilt can be disqualifying. Nor has it been decided if some other showing of prejudice is required and how a trial court should go about determining whether the prejudice exists. Nor, right, this is McAfee, I don't know what to do. No one's never done this before. Nor is it clear whether the analysis differs depending on the pretrial posture of the case, whether that's before conviction or after. So unmoored from precedent, the court feels confined to the boundaries of Williams. So since no one else told me what to do, I'm just going to follow Williams and restricts the application of the facts found here to its limited holding. Weak. So in Williams, the Georgia Supreme Court articulated a standard 
that was to be applied in Georgia for disqualifying forensic misconduct based on a prosecutor's pre-trial extrajudicial statements expressing a belief in the defendant's guilt. So they say, well, this is what happens in Williams, okay? So McAfee says, I didn't know what to do. I couldn't find any guidance on this, so I referred to Williams. They say, oh, you did. Well, here's what Williams says. In determining whether an improper statement of the prosecutor as to the defendant's guilt, so think about a Fannie and a Trump, whether it requires disqualification, here's a standard. The courts have taken into consideration, quote, whether such remarks were part of a calculated plan evincing a design to prejudice the defendant in the minds of the jurors and whether such remarks were inadvertent, albeit improper utterances. All right. Wow. So that's a pretty good standard. So what if we applied that to Fannie? Do you think Fannie's pre-prepared notes that she wrote out for a speech at church, do you think that was a calculated plan? Yeah, obviously they were prepared speech. She went out and gave them at a church. Do you think it was designed to prejudice the defense in the minds of the jurors? Of course, it's her whole constituency in Fulton County. So all of it was not inadvertent. It wasn't speaking off the cuff. It was all prepared. That's a pretty dang good standard. What's so complicated about that, Judge McAfee? Now, as the passage of the order quoted above makes clear, the trial court felt constrained to limit its application of Williams, its particular facts. Williams only applies to Williams because of the lack of Georgia legal precedent addressing forensic misconduct that does not involve prosecutors expressing their belief in a defendant's guilt. Now, in footnote seven, they give us some more background on this. They tell us that the trial court was obviously concerned in its order about the lack of appellate court guidance, which is why we're here appealing. But the absence of precedent involving circumstances similar to those in this case is hardly surprising, right? There's no wonder there's no precedent here because this is insane. No prosecutor has ever been so reckless in a relentless pursuit of personal gain that she provided endless pretrial interviews to the media, granted unprecedented pretrial access to the authors of a book, or attempted to distract from a disqualifying and unethical behavior by publicly and wrongfully castigating the defense as racist and proclaiming God to be having anointed her and to be on her side. But the fact that no case of such outrageous prosecutorial misconduct has ever occurred before and cannot does not mean that the Williams standard is not satisfied. And furthermore, Williams did not purport to enumerate all potential examples of forensic misconduct, which would support the disqualification of a prosecutor either. Saying if this outrageous and unlawful and unethical conduct does not satisfy that standard, well, then the forensic misconduct standard does not, in fact, exist in Georgia. McAfee is on appeal. This is the defense writing, saying by its own terms, the Williams case should not be read in such a limited fashion like McAfee did. Instead, the Williams court noted that the type of forensic misconduct that it addressed in that case was an extrajudicial pretrial comment by a prosecutor on the defendant's guilt, but that one of the primary examples of forensic misconduct was that. It wasn't the only type of forensic misconduct. It was just one of the examples. The court cited to a law review article from Columbia that broadly defines prosecutorial misconduct as any activity by the prosecutor which tends to divert the jury from making its determination of guilt or innocence by weighing the legally admitted evidence in a manner prescribed by law. So you have legal evidence comes in. That's why we have objections, relevancy, not relevant. We keep it out. So when Fannie goes out there and calls them racist and demons, that diverts the jury away. That's in the Williams case. Some footnotes here. They say the court cannot find that the speech crossed the line. Now the trial court McAfee ignored one of the arguments that was made by Willis in the church speech that did in fact comment on the guilt or the innocence of the defense. So McAfee said, well, she wasn't commenting on the defendants or their innocent or guilt. And they say, yeah, she did. Now it's very cute that he found that it didn't, like he read it that way. But Willis twice referred to a 95 or 96% conviction rate for her office. So in the context in which these statements were made, it is clear that she was professing a belief as to the guilt of the defendants. Thus, even under their constrained reading, Scott's constrained reading of Williams, Fannie should have been disqualified for forensic misconduct and it legally erred by not doing so. She was clearly talking about the defense. She was clearly talking about their innocence or guilt and that that enough is alone even under the Williams standard. But the actual standard for disqualifying pre-trial forensic misconduct, so before a conviction happens and the broader but necessary application of the principle set out in Williams is logical. We also have Supreme Court precedent about due process. We also have strict prohibitions on prosecutorial public statements in the ethical rules. So it simply cannot be the case that anything a prosecutor says is fair game. There are rules all over the place that prohibit this. A prosecutor appears
appearing on a national television show to malign and to disparage defendants is not rendered consistent with due process or her ethical obligations merely because she refrains from explicitly saying that they're guilty and only strongly intimates it, like she has to say, I think they're guilty and only then it's a problem. The existing due process and the ethical guardrails already in place extend well beyond simply protecting a defendant from a prosecutorial's prosecutor's pretrial comment on his or her guilt. But because of its admitted uncertainty caused by the lack of the appellate court guidance, the trial court McAfee felt compelled to apply Williams very narrowly, saying by doing that, there is substantial doubt expressed by the trial court in its order that the ruling's correct. And so that's why the Court of Appeals, we need some precedent on this. Now, the appeal from the defense continues, saying Willis's extrajudicial statements are disqualifying. Says Williams, the case that McAfee relied on, instructed that courts must look as to whether statements were made as part of a calculated plan. Clearly they were. Willis's statements and conduct demonstrate a design to prejudice the defense. Here, while many of Willis's statements during this case are alone sufficient misconduct to warrant her disqualification, there are even more. Throughout this investigation and case, Willis has provided numerous interviews to the media, which she called the acts under investigation criminal and illegal. She discussed the mens rea of the accused, right? The mindset, the guilty mind. And she stated that the accused were facing prison sentences. She also gave significant time and exclusive access to the book called Find Me the Votes, knowing full well that it was all going to be released before the defense has their day in court. One in particular stands out. The DA prepared the speech to the church, the historical black church in Atlanta. The trial court noted, said in these public and televised statements, this is McAfee, says Fannie complained that a Fulton County commissioner and quote, so many others questioned her decision to hire Wade. When referring to her detractors throughout the speech, Fannie frequently utilized the plural called they. Fannie argues that the speech was not aimed at any of the defendants. Yeah, maybe so, but maybe not, says the judge. Therein lies the danger of public comment by prosecutors. By including a reference to so many others on the heels of Roman's motion, which instigated this, Fannie left that open for the public to consider. But more at issue, McAfee says, instead of attributing the criticism to a criminal accused general aversion to being convicted and facing a prison sentence, Fannie ascribed the effort as being motivated by playing the race card. She referred to Wade as the black man, while the other unchallenged DAs were labeled one white woman and one white man. To our knowledge, she did not sleep with. And Anna Cross, the other white woman, I think is gone now. The effect of this speech was to cast racial aspersions at an indicted defendant's decision to file the motion. Wild, right? Now, under Williams, that church speech alone is disqualifying, says this appeal. Even if Williams were unclear, the Supreme Court has said this. The heightened public clamor resulting from radio and television coverage will inevitably result in prejudice, just like Fannie wanted. And the fact that Willis has intentionally and publicly injected race and racial bias and religion into this case and any possible jury pool, it makes the disqualification of Fannie and her office even more necessary and appropriate. Now, you remember, Fannie also indicated that the defendants were guilty and she said that they would be convicted. She boasted about her prosecutors and their credentials. She said, we got a superstar team. We got a conviction rate of 95%. We got one that wins and wins and wins. But the comments didn't stop there from Big Fannie. She also indicated that God himself had spoken to her and had qualified her for this case like delusional and that she was doing his work in this prosecution of a rigged case. Now, of course, if she's on God's side, that means everyone else is not. She said, God responds to me. Child, pray for those. They can't see what I've qualified. Wait, God, I'm going to slow down here. It's your hard headed child, said Fanny. I told you I don't want to pray for them. I am tired of being treated cruelly. Pray for them anyway, child. Pray for their hearts. Pray for their souls. I qualified you. I qualified your imperfect, flawed self. I saw you in every hour do my work and ignore the distractions. And that was from Schaefer's motion. Now, the full extent of Fanny's statements will be fully briefed if you accept this appeal, and we can't wait to do that. Now, the U.S. Supreme Court said that discrimination on the basis of race, like what Fanny did, is odious in all aspects, and it's especially pernicious in the administration of justice. Reliance on racial or ethnic bias has no place in the justice system. And because the prosecutor is a representative of the state, it is especially damaging to our constitutional principles when the prosecutor introduces racial discrimination or bias into our jury system. DAs in their offices have been disqualified or recused from prosecutions for making prejudicial 
statements to the media in other cases. Here's some of them. And this was a problem in those cases. And so that is why Fannie should be disqualified here. Now, the forensic misconduct in this case is not limited to her improper statements that evidence her opinions of guilt. They're not limited to her claims of being ordained by God himself to convict the defendants. They're not limited to Fannie and her false disparagement of the defendants or their lawyers as racist for the transgression of bringing to light her indictments and her unethical conduct of her boyfriend. But instead, no, Fannie, in a desperate bid to stave off her disqualification despite this misconduct and despite her stake that's been acquired in this case, she engaged in even more additional and even more deeply troubling forensic misconduct indeed. She knowingly filed a false sworn affidavit of Nathan Wade as part of their response to our discovery motions. And she lied to the court under oath in her testimony before the trial court. So did Nathan Wade. Now the trial court McAfee stopped short of making a finding about Willis's lie because he wanted to protect her office because if Willis lied in this case, whoa, man, then that just means she's kind of a liar, doesn't it? Saying that the court is not under an obligation to ferry out every instance of dishonesty. It's like such a pathetic cop-out. The record shows that the DA prosecuting one of the highest profile cases in this country arguably gave untruthful testimony under oath in this case and committed perjury, says the court needs to address this behavior and disqualify her, right? That is necessary in order for the prosecution to have any believability or any credibility, any legitimacy behind it. But McAfee, such a weenie, didn't do it. Alarmingly, the evidence also demonstrates that even after being rebuked for her improper and unethical behavior in this case by both Judge McBurney in his July order and again by Judge McAfee in his March 15th order and having been already been disqualified because of her actual personal conflict of interest, Fannie is still utterly unrepentant for her individual misconduct and that of Nathan Wade, which we've seen. She showed up, yes, CNN, in his July 25th, 2022 order, McBurney said that Fannie had an actual and untenable conflict. Now, instead of following Georgia law, which required the disqualification of Willis, McBurney took the unprecedented and unlawful step of carving out one of the targets of the investigation from the case, Lieutenant Governor Burt Jones. Now, despite the fact that the decision was contrary to Georgia law, McBurney refused to allow the defense to appeal it. And so you can still minimize this by determining Willis was disqualified, right? So the appeal continues from Sadow and the defendants. When asked by CNN on March 23rd, if she needed to reclaim her reputation, Willis said, let's say it for the record. I'm not embarrassed by anything that I've done. While continuing to claim she'd done nothing illegal. She says, I guess my greatest crime is that I had a relationship with a man, but that's not something I find embarrassing in any way. Hasn't learned her lesson at all. And why should she? Judge McAfee basically did nothing to her. So the defendants here, they maintain below that the dismissal is the truly appropriate remedy. Why? Because Fannie Willis and her office cannot fully undo the damage they've already caused here in this case. But her disqualification is the minimum that must be done to remove the stain of her legally improper and plainly unethical conduct from the remainder of the case. And given her lack of acknowledgement or any remorse whatsoever for her misconduct that has been separately denounced by two superior court judges, her disqualification is necessary to ensure that she cannot continue to violate her heightened ethical obligations as a prosecutor to further prejudice the defendants in this case. And the ABA standards say accordingly, prosecutors have higher duties. They cannot be partisan, political, or personal. And Fannie has already taken two bites of the apple at the expense of the defendants and their due process rights to a disinterested prosecutor and to a fair trial. And Fannie must not get a third bite at this. The rules say accordingly, courts have an independent interest in ensuring that criminal trials are conducted within the highest ethical standards of the profession. Georgia courts have not hesitated to step in and use their inherent authority to disqualify a state prosecutor when required. And consideration of the violation is an important part of the analysis, saying, additionally, while all attorneys are officers of this court and all attorneys have a duty of candor to the court, prosecutors have more. They have a heightened duty of candor to the courts and other professional obligations. And here, the defendants submit that Fannie Willis's untruthful testimony, which was done to protect her personal interests in this prosecution, over and at the expense of the case itself is at the very least forensic misconduct. Now, the Georgia courts are not only empowered to disqualify Fannie to ensure this trial will be conducted within the ethical standards of this profession, but in fact, they're obligated to do so to protect the integrity of the remaining proceedings and the constitutional rights of the defense. And as DA Willis has herself acknowledged, she said, when you represent citizens, you need to be beyond reverse.
reproach. Can you believe that? Here, Fanny has covered herself and her office in scandal and disrepute and taint, as she has squandered her credibility and repeatedly and flagrantly violated the heightened ethical standards demanded of her position. The evidence of her forensic misconduct is overwhelming, and accordingly, the disqualification is required. Now, the trial court and their decision to not disqualify her is a structural error. It violates the defendant's due process rights, and it seriously denigrates the public confidence in the integrity of our justice system. And the appeal continues, saying the order's failure to find an actual conflict and its proposed remedy is also an error. Saying, you know, Court of Appeal, Scott McAfee also screwed up here. As noted, the erroneous failure to disqualify Fanny, who already has a personal stake in the interest, is subject to automatic reversal. So, that's clear. Now here, though, the trial court erred in not holding that Fanny was operating under an actual conflict based on the facts that the court found itself. The court found that these things happened, and so if these things happened, that's a conflict. But the judge found differently. Additionally, the remedy that Scott McAfee imposed are unprecedented in Georgia, and they do nothing to remedy the actual improprieties that they actually found. And so the trial court, Scott, erred in declining to disqualify Fanny based on her actual conflict of interest the remedy is legally insufficient. They say Willis acquired a personal interest that requires and necessitates her disqualification. Here's how it works. A personal disqualifying interest that can arise from either an actual conflict or an appearance. Lawyers, the rules say, must avoid even the appearance of impropriety so that justice is not diminished. And where an actual conflict exists, this certainly requires disqualification. And just on the facts that were found by the trial court itself, an actual conflict exists. A big problem between her public duties and her private interests. The appeal says, Fannie Willis hired her lover, her paramour, to be the lead prosecutor in this case and then paid him 650 grand to do it. Now compounding this problem, Fannie then directly benefited from hiring her lover. Now the trial court also erroneously found that the amount in issue was between 12 grand to 15 grand, but the record of evidence submitted to the court shows the amount is over 17,000. Now, Either way, the amount is significant because it's more than 150 times greater than the $100 limiting threshold that are in the requirements of Fulton County. Wade paid for lavish vacations around the world. Wade was funded from the 650 grand that Willis paid him. Now, ostensibly, because they knew it was wrong and because they knew it was a conflict, Willis and Wade actively hid their romantic and their financial relationship from virtually everyone, the public, the defense, and the courts. And when questioned about these benefits, both Fanny and Wade gave false testimony to the trial court in an attempt to cover up their tracks. And Fannie compounded this. She filed two false certifications that she had received no gifts or no benefits that were over $100, even though Wade was literally listed on the form as a prohibited source. And the aggregate amounts far exceeded $100. $17,000 is a lot more than $100. Now, they covered their tracks. Willis, in doing all of that, obviously, allowed her private interest to overtake and compromise her public duties. That was an actual conflict of interest. But even if Willis was not actually conflicted, well, she should have been disqualified based on Scott McAfee's determination that she appeared to have a conflict based on the evidence. Criminal defendants have a fundamental right to have a disinterested prosecutor. So whenever a prosecutor's conduct creates at least an appearance of impropriety, that means the defense is denied their rights to a fair trial. And under those circumstances, when they're denied a right to a fair trial, they're entitled to a new one. So whether there is an actual conflict or whether there's an appearance of a conflict, the law requires McAfee got it wrong, the disqualification. You can't cure it by getting rid of one of them. And so the trial court erred in determining that no actual conflict exists. Fannie Willis, her office, and Wade, they are trustees and they're servants of the people. Indeed, as the Supreme Court has said, a trustee is entitled to something stricter than the morals of the marketplace. They're held to something stricter than that. In Georgia, not honesty alone, but the punctilio of honor, the most sensitive, is then the standard of behavior. As to this, there has developed a tradition that it unbending and inveterate. So the most basic rule is that no public agent or trustee shall have the opportunity or be led into the temptation to make a profit out of others entrusted to their care. Put another way, all public officers labor under every disability and prohibition imposed by the law, and they can't make financial gains. And so prosecutors are supposed to represent the public interest, and they're required to preserve the integrity of the criminal justice system. Not recently. And as such, and the Georgia Supreme Court has found, prosecutors have additional professional responsibilities.
responsibilities even more than other lawyers. And thus prosecutors must wield their formidable criminal enforcement powers in a rigorously disinterested fashion to preserve the public's faith in the fairness of the system. And criminal defendants have a constitutional right to a disinterested prosecutor as well. And Fannie has failed to meet those obligations. As the trial court has found, Fannie and her actions created a financial cloud of impropriety. Her conflict creates a stain on the judicial process, impairs the defense right to a fair proceeding, and requires her disqualification. And so prior to the disqualification motions, Fannie also publicly stated in her filing pleadings before this came out, she said that the prosecutor has a heightened duty of candor to the courts. DA Willis knows that she has that heightened duty. She put it in a filing, but she has repeatedly failed that duty. So her conflict creates a stain on the judicial process, impairs the defendant's right to a fair proceeding, and accordingly, it requires her disqualification here. And so based on the foregoing Court of Appeals, the trial court, as a matter of law, erred in determining that Fannie Willis did not have an actual conflict requiring her disqualification. They made a mistake. Georgia Court of Appeals have found that public officers cannot have financial gain at the benefit of the public, that a public trustee's duty is to act not just with honesty alone, but with honor of the most sensitive kind. And a prosecutor cannot acquire a personal interest or a stake in their convictions. All of that is a no-no. And so if the law means anything in Georgia, the trial court's actual findings here establish an actual conflict, saying the trial court also erred for refusing to disqualify her. Says Georgia courts regularly disqualify private lawyers for simply an appearance or a possibility of a conflict. Happens all the time. When there's an appearance of impropriety, such as those the trial court found here, then disqualify qualification must follow, as this court has found. This concept makes sense intuitively and in the context of existing law. If private lawyers are disqualified from representing their clients based on a finding of an appearance of impropriety, well then so too are prosecutors because prosecutors are held to an even higher standard, right? It's like when your younger brother did something that was illegal to mom, he might get away with it because he's younger than you. But if you did that same thing, whoo, you're in big trouble. And I know that because I have two brothers younger. So I guess my point is, if it's bad for the younger brother, then it's obviously bad for the older brother who should know better and has heightened responsibilities. Fanny fell below even the lower brother standard. Even the younger brother was like, I would never do that. I'm not an idiot. Fanny's like, I'm jumping in. Who are held to even higher professional standards that are required by due process to be disinterested. She's clearly not. In Davenport versus State, for example, a defendant convicted of assaulting her husband on appeal was denied due process because the DA in the case had represented the husband during the divorce. Now, this court agreed, said there was at least an appearance of impropriety there. And so that's a problem that denied fundamental fairness in the case. And so the court ordered a new trial. Same thing in this case, the court held that a trial court also erred by not getting rid of a DA because the DA may not be compensated by means of a fee arrangement, which guarantees at least the appearance of a conflict of interest. Now, in this case, Battelle versus State, another defendant was convicted for murder. He argued on appeal that the DA should have disqualified himself because the victim parent work there. Supreme Court of Georgia began its analysis. They said a conflict of interest or the appearance of impropriety from a close personal relationship with the victim may be grounds for disqualification. And so based on the facts of that case, the court said that there was no evidence that there was a conflict, but it could be. But the fact remains that the appearance could be enough to disqualify somebody. And so what's important here as the appeal concludes is that Scott McAfee, the trial court, expressly found an appearance of impropriety existed, says, Yep, there it is. And based on that finding, Willis was required to be disqualified. That's it. Nothing in the law anywhere says that the remedy for an appearance of impropriety is disqualification of apparently one other lawyer, but not the other. That's not the case. Yet that is what McAfee did. If Wade was apparently conflicted and he needed to be to be disqualified, as they found, then Willis necessarily was also conflicted and also must be disqualified. And because the trial court properly found that an appearance of impropriety existed as to both Willis and Wade, the law requires the disqualification of them both. Otherwise, the appearance of impropriety is not cured, and neither the public nor the accused can have the required confidence in the impartiality or the fairness of the criminal process. Saying the trial court, Scott McAfee, specifically determined that when the appearance of a conflict exists, only the affected prosecutor, be they elected or appointed, is affected and must be disqualified. And the court also found that both Willis 
and Wade were so affected here. So which under Georgia law requires the disqualification of both. And so the trial court, instead of providing Willis with the option to simply remove Wade, provided them with the option to simply remove Wade, confounds logic and is contrary to Georgia law. And because DA Willis is disqualified, so too is her whole office. Goodbye, Fulton County. As the Georgia Supreme Court has made clear, when the elected DA is wholly disqualified from the case, the assistant DA, whose only power to prosecute a case is derived from the constitutional authority of the DA who appointed them, they have no authority to proceed. You all have to go. Citing this McLaughlin case saying, that case also emphasizes the fact that a prosecutor's actual or apparent conflict need not be monetary or disqualifying. There, a DA and her office were disqualified because the DA's daughter was a classmate of one of the victims. Thus, close personal friendships, familial relationships, other circumstances can give rise to disqualifying conflicts of interest in addition to disqualification based on the financial conflicts of interest. Okay, so they write, in conclusion, for the within and the foregoing reasons, this court should grant the defense application and accept the interlocutory appeal. Very good filing here. So sending this to everybody, Fanny got a copy, Adam Abate got a copy, Daisha Young, we saw yesterday, got a copy, F. McDonald Wakeford, John Wooten, Grant Rude, no Anna Cross on that list. Anna Cross is not on the game anymore. This is brought by Christopher Anilwitz and the rest of the co-defendants. So I think a very nice filing. They're essentially saying Judge McAfee just got it wrong, right? He found there was an appearance of impropriety and the appearance of impropriety is enough and she needs to go accordingly. And I think it was very well you know, written, very well argued. There was that question I had about the start date. So I'm pretty sure that was a typo and that this actually started. The indictment was actually in 2023 because it was so compressed. If Fanny is allowed to stay on this case, she is going to continue the taint. She's going to continue to stink up this entire trial with a noxious odor. And long story short, I'm very hopeful that the Court of Appeals here in Georgia accepts it. We'll see what the Court of Appeals in Georgia says, whether they will ultimately accept it or not. We see here from our friend Phil Holloway, who's also on YouTube now. He's got a great channel now. And he said this, from Georgia, they only need one judge to accept this, okay? It's going to be assigned to a three-judge panel. It only requires one judge to agree to allow the appeal to proceed. That's from Phil Holloway on X at Phil Holloway ESQ. Here is what this looks like. Apparently, Fannie Willis was at some event. She speaks at the Women of the Shields Awards. So Fannie Willis was out speaking on Friday, and here's what Fannie had to say. A little 40-second clip here from her speech. Let's see what Fannie had to say here. Get this volume going. Recently, they tell me they don't like me to talk hard out here, always having to prove yourself two and three times. Recently, they tell me they don't like me to talk about race. Well, I'm gonna talk about it anyway. Truth is, it's some challenges that come to being black. And I see so much... That's fine if you talk about race, you can't talk about it calling co-defendants racist. Greatness in this city that has so many great African-American leaders. And I appreciate all of the sacrifice that you all have had to be in these positions. So, Chief Meadows, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for having the intelligence to create an event like this where we recognize that you've had to go through a little more to serve. All right, so that's Fannie. We're going to see what the Court of Appeals says, whether they accept this filing. We're certainly hopeful that they do. But we're going to be here continuing to cover all of the Fannie Willis saga news, all the filings. We'll see what her office says, if this is accepted, what they say in response to it. But it is another one marked down in the disqualification battle. Fannie's not out of the woods yet. We'll see what the Court of Appeals says. So we'll be here covering that and all of the rest of the litigation, my friends. Thank you for joining us as we do. Grateful when you subscribe. Appreciate you liking this video. Thanks for inviting someone you know or love to come over here and join us so that they can see all of what's happening behind the scenes on these cases. Of course, we got some great links down in the description below. We'd love it if you became a member, joined us, supported our work, got access to our morning streams for our members only, for our Saturday streams, again, for members and our after parties at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. We'd love to see you back over there and back here on the next one.